It's 11.15 now, so I'll get started. Hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us here for day one of the Best Centers Annual Institute. I'd like to once again introduce Marianne Piet, who has been with us for the last few sessions as a moderator. And this time she'll be presenting the need for grid interactive efficient buildings, what they are and why they're important for decarbonization. Marianne is a senior scientist and director of the Building Technology and Urban Systems Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And at the lab, Marianne oversees building technology research activities for the US Department of Energy, which covers appliance standards, technology analysis and tools to accelerate deployment, new building technologies, modeling and analysis, commercial and residential building systems integration, grid interactive communications, and integration with EVs, storage, and PVs. Marianne's most recent work explores how to accelerate decarbonization while ensuring equity and affordability. We'll have some time at the end to answer audience questions, which you can add to the Q&A or chat functions. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Marianne. Thanks, Laura. Uh Thanks and welcome back for those of you who've been uh, participating in this morning's events and the, uh, those of you who are just joining, I'm glad to have you with us today. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit about the history of building science, give you a sort of a big picture overview. And we've been talking about decarbonization this morning and grid interactive efficient buildings. I'll talk about what those are and the US Department of Energy's roadmap around GEBS. I'll also talk about the California Load Flexibility Research and Deployment Hub, which is a four-year program that Andrew McAllister mentioned in his opening remarks about research in California. And I'll summarize with some concepts for future directions. Please do feel free to enter your questions and comments in chat, and I'll try to leave a few minutes at the end, about 10 minutes just for Q&A. So when we think about building science and building technologies, we always start by thinking about what motivated a lot of the research we're doing today on energy efficiency. And the oil embargo was a big change in the way we think about buildings and energy. Because in the oil embargo, the concept was that we wanted to reduce our dependence on foreign oil and make our energy systems more secure by being more efficient and having less dependence on imported energy technologies. But at the same time, when we use energy, we don't want to just use less, we need to use less and make sure we're meeting the needs of health and comfort. So we do a lot of research in indoor health. And when we do all of these things, HVAC systems, water heating, et cetera, we care about the people in the buildings and their health. One of the grand challenges has been as we move uh, more buildings into cities, we have things like urban heat islands. And so that makes us think about the technologies associated with resilient heat or of course, of course extreme cold can happen as well. The changing grid has made a massive impact on how we think about decarbonization and building technologies. Things like wildfires, more smoke, more heat, influence the way we think about the technology. So when we operate the building for COVID and we bring in more outside air, we actually wanna do exactly the opposite in events where we have extreme smoke outside. So we wanna think about how our HVAC systems can handle these different modes, grid interactive mode, outdoor smoke mode, renewable integration, uh, COVID controls, and then equity. Equity has been a really big impact on the research portfolio at the National Labs. And I think all of you are gonna see this in your own communities to think about the equity associated with the technologies that we're putting into buildings and how to make sure that uh, the low income and moderate income communities are also benefiting from our new technologies and buildings. So the Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings Roadmap is an effort that took uh, over a year and a half to develop. And this is a strategy that's, you can download the entire roadmap at geb.lbl.gov. And the roadmap outlines key activities 
towards helping to ensure that buildings are better integrated with the grid. And I'll talk a little about why that's needed and, and what that looks like. But that's uh, the deep dive of this particular presentation. Uh, there have been hundreds of surveys and interviews and uh, analysis that Jared in the last session did. Uh, so we're trying to understand where we are today and what does it take to become grid interactive. So why do we need grid interactive efficient buildings? Here's four key reasons. One is that we want to make sure that we can integrate with a changing grid. When you have variable electricity use, you need flexible demand because the electricity is not available continuously. So as demand changes, as supply changes, we want demand to be flexible. Also, the electric system is aging in many parts of the country, and we want to help reduce the costs for upgrading the technology. For example, if we have a, an area where electric loads are growing, uh, we can actually use demand response, load flexibility and energy efficiency to defer the need to upgrade the system, to make a bigger system. So if we can keep the electricity use down and manage the peaks, those, those coincident peaks when everything is peaking all at once, is very expensive because we have to build more transmission and distribution systems for those peak hours. We want to assist in decarbonization. So we want to use more of the clean energy and less of the dirty energy. And th what that looks like around the country is very different. So the strategies in California are going to be different than the strategies in Ohio. Texas is a wind-based renewable system. California tends to have more solar, although we both have wind and solar. But we see regional differences and the way we interact with those resources that are going to vary. And finally, we really want to understand how to work with people. What do customers prefer? How do we make these things grid interactive and make it easy for the customer so the customer doesn't have to be navigating complex user interfaces and prices? So flex flexible building loads can benefit owners, occupants, and the grid. These are four key attributes of what we call grid interactive efficient buildings. We don't want grid interactive inefficient buildings. Typically, we want to do all the energy efficiency we can first. If we want to put in a heat pump, we want to do the windows at the same time so we can put in a smaller heat pump and make that heat pump more cost effective. So we want to continue to invest in energy efficiency. We want to work on communication. So the, the, a grid interactive efficient building is communicating with the grid. It may be one way or two way, we say two way here, but it may be receiving prices in a one way communication system, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But we wanna also have communication with the occupants and ideally even within the home, we might have multiple technologies communicating. Smart analytics are part of GEVs. Historically, it's been really hard to get data out of buildings, but it, we're getting better at building automation systems that can trend log, uh, heat pumps that report their power use, LED lights and such. So we wanna be able to have data and smart sensors that help us control these things as integrated systems. And fi finally, flexibility. So the key issue here is to make sure that these technologies can shift and modulate and, and be dynamic. And sometimes that means storage, we'll talk a little about storage, or sometimes it just means um, I'm gonna run my dishwasher when the price of electricity is the lowest. Typically, that also means the price of electricity is the, the, the source of electricity is the cleanest. So we have, in general, we want electric prices that reflect system conditions, and we want loads that are tracking that those system conditions and changing their uh, shape and, sh and shifting loads uh, according to what's happening at the grid. Now the roadmap presents a variety of actions that can be taken by a wide range of industry stakeholders. And it does include training and workforce. I will provide you with just a high level overview of the roadmap. Um, we want to estimate the value of the GEB opportunities to the power system, which I'll show you some of that data define the GEB technology features and integration considerations, identify and prioritize barriers towards GEB deployment and achieving the untapped potential, and then define options for overcoming the barriers 
and recommend key actions for all stakeholders. So as I mentioned earlier, we had practitioners, researchers, policymakers, and a number of others contribute to the roadmap in a series of interviews that were done. This wasn't just something that DOE and the labs did, but we need to understand the stakeholders that are part of the vision for what's needed to transition our buildings to be more grid interactive. Now the GAB adoption would significantly increase existing US demand response and energy efficiency. So demand response typically has been on hot summer days. There may be uh, a, an event where it's very hot and the electricity use the peaks at a certain hour because everybody has their air conditioners on. That uh, is a certain type of uh, program that's been underway for several decades. Uh, today, there's about 10 gigawatts of demand response in the United States for buildings. And you can see there that uh, most of that's been residential. So residential air conditioning load control has been around for a couple of decades. Commercial buildings, we're starting to see more involvement. Um, some of them use something called open ADR, which is a, a communications technology that's used to send signals to the buildings. In the middle column there is the 2030 potential for mid adoption and then 2030 potential for high adoption. So we're trying to get about a 26 to 44 gigawatts of demand flexibility. And we, as we move from traditional demand response to what we call demand flexibility, it's not just about those 10 days a year where the grid events are being called, but it's a continuous capability not only to reduce load during the peak hours, but to consume more during the clean hours. So we're moving from demand response to demand flexibility. And on the right are the similar energy efficiency savings. So today we have about 200 terawatt hours of energy efficiency split in half potentially by the residential and commercial buildings. As we move out to 2030 and to, uh, mid adoption and high adoption, You'll see there about 500 terawatts or 600 terawatts of uh, energy efficiency. And I'll, I'll wait until the last slide, but basically we're looking at the idea of trying to triple the demand flexibility and the energy efficiency over the next 10 years. Uh, so that 200 terawatt hours to 600 terawatt hours is really what we're, we're looking to do. We're trying to enable more energy efficiency uh, and it made more load flexibility. And this, these numbers are about the grid and about the power system in the United States. This slide here moves us towards emissions. And on the, uh, the y-axis here are the different regions of the country. And on the x-axis is the, ki the kilograms of CO2 per megawatt hour. So in California, uh, when we, when we have more uh, adoption of renewables, you'll see we save so many kilograms of CO2 per megawatt hour. California is actually already a fairly clean electric system. But in the upper Midwest and the lower Midwest, uh, we can save up to 500 kilograms of CO2 per megawatt hour with GEBS. So we're doing both energy efficiency investments and investments in technology to ena enable more demand flexibility. These metrics are generated from the Jared Langevin, who you heard from in the earlier session. But in general, we're looking to try to save 80 million tons of CO2 annually by 2030. And that's equivalent to about 6% of all the power sector CO2 emissions. So this is equivalent to about 50 medium-sized coal plants or 70, 17 million cars. And these are numbers that are uh, focused on uh, energy efficiency and the changing for low flexible technologies. This is not an aggressive decarbonization modeling. That's actually on top of this. So the when we deploy heat pumps at scale, we'll get even higher numbers. Um, these analyses were done uh, about two years ago. And we're in the process of continuing to do modeling around this technology as mentioned in Jared's talk. Now, I wanna help you understand what is happening in the electric utility industry. 
On the y-axis is demand response versus load flexibility. And I mentioned air conditioner cycling, um, but we also have programs that use something called open ADR, which is a signaling technology where the utility might send a signal to a commercial building and the commercial building uses an open ADR platform to receive a signal and then change the set points. Typically we change zone level uh, set points and we create uh, a strategy that occurs only during a DR event. But we also want to make sure that we're investing in energy efficiency at the same time. So as you know, there's a lot of old control systems in the field today. And when we retrofit those, we can improve the energy efficiency of the building as well as the demand response capability. And we're also wor working towards creating DER aggregation pilots. In the early today, we talked about the Connected Communities Program, uh, the EcoBlock Program you're gonna hear about later in the, the Best Institute. Uh, so we think about a variety of technologies that create more capabilities for buildings to inter interact with the grid. And on the x-axis is the concept of simple energy efficiency versus smart energy management. So in these slides, we show you uh, the concept that if you change a light bulb, that's a simple energy efficiency concept, but smart energy management programs use data and analytics. So we really want utility programs that both invest in energy efficiency, analytics, and grid interactive capabilities. As we could develop the GAB roadmap, we were very concerned with the concept of control systems. Fundamentally, the control system is designed to provide building services to occupants. Those might be comfort, hot water, refrigeration, uh, and physical systems that your heat pump, your chiller, your lighting system, those all interact with uh, through a user interface and some sort of sensing. And there's two kinds of control. There's local control, which might be a smart thermostat, and there's supervisory control, which might integrate across end uses or multiple services like heating and ventilation. Some of these technologies are, are integrated. So we've been looking at how do we make sure that we're interfacing with the grid at the right level of control systems and that we are investing in interoperability. So one of the things you're gonna hear later in the week also is the idea of uh, open standards to make sure that control systems from different companies can interoperate. Also, we need to be able to interact with, with the photovoltaics, the EVs and the storage. So we have a big challenge thinking about how to advance the integration of these technologies so that the homeowner makes sure that his uh, be his EV from one company, his battery from another company, and his dishwasher and his smart thermostat can interoperate. So that's one of the challenges in this field. This is an example of the type of technologies that are going to improve the ability of buildings to be grid interactive. The red is a special class of technology around thermal energy storage. Today, we do see thermal energy storage in district energy systems. For example, many of the campuses around the country have large chill water tanks. We particularly are working with one out at UC Merced where there's a large chill water tank. UC Davis, uh, many campuses in Texas have these TES tanks. So we're seeing those and we wanna be able to use those in new ways. Thermal energy storage in HVAC has been around a long time. Uh, we've had ICE, uh, CalMax systems, TES and refrigeration is emerging. It's very exciting to see a lot of companies working on technologies for, for frozen food. Thermal energy storage in the building envelope. We're starting to see phase change materials uh, in ceiling panels and in walls, but there's a lot of research in new thermal energy storage materials that are gonna enable more grid interactive efficient buildings. In the orange are various uh, physical technologies, atta window attachments, new heat pump water heaters, dynamic glazing, HVAC and hot water combination systems. And the line is what's commercially available today. So things to the left, you'll see more in the field. Things to the right are uh, more in development. In dark blue above the line are the local control. And then the lighter blue is the supervisory control. So we really are looking for predictive control and multi-building control and integrated systems 
that's really uh, the holy grail is if we can take the systems below the line, the physical systems, uh, allow supervisory control, but also allow that integrated control uh, where there's a lot of research that's still going on to understand how to enable model predictive control that can take the outside temperature, the price of electricity, how many people are in the building, the schedule, and optimize the control system so that it's using more of that clean energy, saving money, providing more comfort, uh, and using less energy during the dirty times of the grid. This slide shows you some of the pillars related to the, the GEB roadmap. It's organized around the research and development, which I've just highlighted in a couple of my slides, uh, enhancing the value of demand flexibility, empowering GEB users, and allowing them in operations and supporting demand flexibility through state and local programs. So to summarize, DOE has been working on the concept of tripling energy efficiency uh, for residential and commercial buildings by 2030 relative to 2020, working with stakeholders, working with strong leadership again, across the market and the actors and the policy and the programs, and then thinking about their legal authorities and convening powers to mitigate CO2 emissions. And DOE will play a key role in GEBS. I'm gonna give you a really quick overview of something called CalFlex Hub. This is a, a three and a half year program that involves 16 partners that I list there and a set of technologies that we're testing and able to understand how to foster more grid interactive efficient buildings in California. And we have 12 projects that we're starting with. I'll give you a quick overview of some of those, but we're looking to create a portfolio of activity uh, to make sure that we understand how we can enable buildings. And every year we're evaluating whether or actually we're investing in the best technology. So we have this concept of the hub portfolio management where we're assessing multiple metrics associated with these technologies. Are they cost effective? Does it reduce bills? Does it reduce GHG? Can it be integrated? Can it receive a price? So we have a, a, a set of activities around that concept. CalFlex Hub is focused on the duck curve, which I show here in the right. That's a, the green is the, the, the load and the red there is the amount of electricity on Memorial Day that we actually couldn't use because uh, the electric system is not so flexible and we generated more electricity than we could use. That's almost free electricity. So if we can get prices to reflect those conditions, we could get technologies that can consume those energies. This picture here at the bottom right is the storage system at UC Merced. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at the idea of the ability to use prices and dynamic systems to, to trigger the demand response and demand flexibility. That'll include time of use signals, but also things like uh, greenhouse gas signals and using the internet as well as FM broadcast. Uh, the concept is prices to devices, and that concept's been around for a while, but we're really excited to think about that concept uh, in order to think about real-time pricing, critical peak pricing, and understanding can we use integrated storage and HVAC systems that will enable us to you take this technology and deploy it at some scale, looking at the affordability, the carbon content, and the mixture of both systems. This is my second to last slide. And this is what Andrew McAllister showed earlier today. This is the market informed demand automation server. So CalFlex Hub will have a price server where we're actually taking tariffs that the utilities are providing and doing tests with water heaters, uh, HVAC systems, EVs, storage systems, uh, and even electronic controllers in homes to try to understand, can we get these systems to respond to prices? This will be something like an open ADR signal. The utilities have been using open ADR to communicate demand response, but this is continuously sending signals to buildings. And the vision is in the future that all buildings receive their tariff in a machine readable form. And the tariff reflects system conditions that allows us 
to be very price responsive and to ensure that we're using the, the most of the low cost electricity, which is also the cleanest electricity. And then we're, we're changing our consumption patterns when the electric cost is high. So again, we're using the internet as well as FM broadcast to try to get to underserved communities. This is my last slide. So just to summarize, we're gonna be working on the concept of evaluating the capability of any systems to respond to prices, identifying new technology that can deepen the response, understanding the price and carbon signals, and then understanding how to overcome barriers to deployment and utility costs. So I will stop right there and I see there's a couple of questions. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, jump right into the, the Q&A. Um, what challenges do the IOUs or investor-owned utilities face in this new world of decarbonization, grid interactivity, and differential pricing, even for consumers? And how is the business model of IOUs changing? Yeah, so the utilities use prices to collect their revenue. And so one of the challenges for them is there's a lot of risk associated with these dynamic prices. They the, the, and customers don't necessarily like them, but it may be a public good when we move to these prices that are more dynamic. We're actually um, pricing electricity that's more related to its true cost. And uh, customers haven't seen that uh, variation in their rates. Uh, so we're going to be needing to educate customers and the utilities are, are concerned about complexity. So we're hoping that the control systems can help manage some of that complexity. And besides the economics, what, what actually happens on the electric grid when there's a surplus of electricity? Does it increase the frequency or backfeed the generators or otherwise? That's a really good question. I, I don't know that much about it. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it's, I will say that the utilities actually ran something called the excess supply pilot. So they were paying people to take load. Uh, now, we don't turn on the lights at Levi Stadium. Uh, we want to charge that thermal storage tank. So hopefully we're figuring out good things to use that electricity for. So that is that is actually a challenge. Are there pilot studies between utilities and buildings that have tested grid interactivity? Yes. So um, we've been running something called the Demand, Res Demand Response Research Center for several years. And when we developed open ADR, for, for about 10 years, we had pilots with the utilities where we automated critical peak pricing. So we actually sent uh, digital signals uh, and we changed the sequence of operations and we have a lot of experience. We can typically save about a half to one watt a square foot. And we have a number of projects now with the utilities to try to um, enable continuous communication so the CalFlex Hub will be doing some of that, but there's been a, there there are more than pilot studies. There are full scale programs. Another question that came in about um, the the GED roadmap did did the GED roadmap look at the different business models to overcome technology cost barriers associated with traditional approaches to capital costs. Um, and stated for, for example, the distributed, distributed energy resources as a service models that some aggregators and other market players employ, wherein someone other than the customer or consumer or building owner owns and manages the energy asset. Yeah, so uh, that's a really good uh, comment. So there are this idea of virtual power plants where a third party might own the DERs you know, the EV charging systems, the batteries, the batteries are maybe the best example. Um, and, and we do, there is some discussion of the, those sorts of business models and aggregator platforms that is in the GAB roadmap. Vermont Power is known for some of, you know, bring your own device. We have bring your own thermostat programs, but we have bring your own device programs and a third party will help subsidize those uh, technology investments. We have some rapid fire questions. There's, um, we have about a minute left in this session, but, but three more questions that came in. And um, I think since we're up against a break, I think we can continue on. Um, how do we get the governing entities like the CEC or CPUC to allow CCAs to develop programs that will allow peak energy saving? Um, and is this already in the works? 
And uh, the comment is everything seems to be based on what the utilities have available. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, I don't know the answer to how to get this to allow the CCAs to develop uh, the peak energy savings programs. Part of it is the market model that um, we have to have, they have to have value in the wholesale market. So hopefully in their procurement of power, uh, there's some value to the peak reduction programs uh, that the CCA will, will find a value, but I don't know a lot about the details of that. The qu next question is, um, the price is fine, but what about the concept of having minimum carbon drive use, or are these always the same? Yeah, so uh, we, we are testing the watt time signal as a control system. Uh, watt time is a real-time carbon signal. Um, you can take a look at their system, and it you can follow a watt time signal, but it may or may not be coincident with your prices. Now today, under time of use pricing for residential homes, um, the price is high from four to nine, but it's it's the same the rest of the hours, okay? So, but if you followed a watt time signal, it may tell you that the lowest price is from 10 a.m. to uh, 3 p.m. And that may be uh, the, the cleanest hours, but those prices may not be available. There, there is some idea that we would have more time differentiated prices, um, but that, that's still an emerging issue. So, so yes, uh, we still need to work on dynamic prices that reflect the carbon system better. Finally, one more question is, um, what kinds of models are you using to project demand so buildings know what's coming in terms of electricity cost? So to project demand, we're using the historical. So we might look at the electricity use by time of day, hour, time of day, day of week, and outside temperature. And then for the electricity costs, uh, we'll use uh, wholesale market conditions or some sort of real-time price signal from the wholesale grid. So we could look at historically at, at Monday when it's 80 degrees outside at 3 p.m. It uses this much. So we de develop these model predictive control systems have learning algorithms that say, what's my electric load in the next 24 hours? And how do I um, change that to save money or reduce GHG relative to that projection of GHG or, or electricity prices? So that there, we will be publishing soon some of the machine learning algorithms and model predictive control examples of technologies. We're doing it, UC Merced. We're using that TES system. We're actually charging it in the middle of the day when it's cleaner. And at UC Merced, we're saving about uh, one uh, gigaton, one metric ton of CO2 per day uh, by, by changing the way we control that TES, not charging it at night, charging it in the middle of the day when it's cleanest. So uh, I should have ended it a little earlier to answer all those questions, but great questions. And thank you so much, Laura, for uh, hosting this session. Thanks, Marianne. Um, I'd like to direct everyone to the, the next session with uh, Professor William Banfleth on indoor air quality management after COVID-19. Um, thank you again, Marianne. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining.